Um, okay, so I want to try and introduce you to a new form of AI called hierarchical temporal memory. Um, uh, normally, when uh, people hear that I'm dealing with AI, they say, oh, okay, you into deep neural nets, right? And I said, nope, I'm not. There's other things besides that. Um, the deep neural nets are really, really useful in their pro program domain, but you have to be aware of their limitations. And those limitations, one of them, are, because of those limitations, I wouldn't call them uh, artificial intelligence, rather I'd call them assistive intelligence. So uh, uh, DNNs can be very dangerous if you don't know the limitations, but if you consider them just assistance and not artificial intelligence, then you're okay. So they've clocked up a lot of really great successes, um, but they need uh, thousands, if not millions of samples to work. They uh, find it very hard to adapt to, to changing data, and uh, they're pretty easy to fool sometimes, though so they're now taking uh, the steps to prevent that. And they're very susceptible to noise, but f as far as I'm concerned, uh, deep neural nets don't work as our brains do, and they can't really lead us to true AI. HDM, or well, hierarchical temporal memory, this is a theoretical framework for uh, biological and generalized uh, machine intelligence. It's uh, based on our latest understanding of the neocortex, and it's in contrast to DNNs, it only needs a few hundred samples to, uh, to get going and to uh, start making predictions. It learns unsupervised and, again, in contrast to DNNs, it learns as it goes and it can correct its mistakes. And incredibly, it's, in, it's immune to about, oh, sorry, 40% uh, of noise. And most importantly, as uh, I think at least, that it opens up the way to truly intelligent systems. Okay, a little bit of history. Uh, the ball started going um, in 2004 when Jeff Hawkins, for those that are old enough to know, he invented the Palm Pilot, uh, sold, uh, made his millions, sold his business, and formed a research uh, lab to in, uh, reverse engineer the neocortex and apply it, what he learned to AI. Uh, after a few years, he released his work as open source, and uh, though the API is still in Python 2.7 and C++, there's a community effort now porting it to 3.0. Uh, a lot of third-party implementations already, uh, including those on GPUs uh, in almost every language you can think of. And it's constantly evolving. So as they learn more and more about the neocortex, uh, they improve the uh, model of HDM. Uh, Numenta, which is the establishment that he formed, is uh, so open that you can watch their research meetings on Twitch live if you're so inclined. So let's talk about the neocortex. It's about 75% of your brain. It's a thin layer on the brain, about two and a half millimeters thick. Now, if I would unwrap it and fold it out, uh, this is about what you would get. So this is you. This is your neocortex. Uh, this is what's uh, giving this talk, and this is what's listening to this talk, just this little napkin. It's got uh, billions of neurons, and it's, oops, I'm wandering, and it's got uh, tens of thousands of synapses, or thousands of synapses for the neurons. So there's uh, an immense number of connections there. And the important thing, though, is that it's, it's only 2% of your neurons at any one time are active. And this is how your brain succeeds in doing a lot of things with very little power. Uh, so what does the neocortex do? Okay, first of all, it's always predicting its inputs. Uh, as I look around the room, I'm predicting I'm going to see a lot of people, and, well, that prediction falls 
falls down, so I have to uh, update my model, which is another thing that the newer cortex is doing. And it's also generating behaviors like I'm doing at the moment, I'm giving this talk. Uh, now, the, uh, a really incredible thing that was, uh, that's been discovered about the neocortex is that it is uniform. It, it doesn't matter where you look in it, it looks the same. The visual cortex looks the same, the auditory system looks the same, the areas that deal with touch look the same. Uh, so what distinguishes one region from the other and that, that is the, uh, what they're connected to. So visual cortex is connected to your eyes, your auditory uh, uh, cortex is connected to your ears. And there is a basic, basic unit of replication which is called a cortical column. There are about uh, two million of them. So we, we would expect that what makes, uh, so that the, if the cortical column is a basic replication, it's also the basis of computation. So we need to un understand the cortical column if we want to understand what goes on in the neocortex. Uh, you can see here uh, micrographs of the uh, of cortical column. Uh, what point, uh, stands out is that it's divided into layers. There's lots of different types of neurons. The neurons are all lined up in what's called mini columns. Uh, there's um, many uh, connections between layers and there are connections, uh, lateral connections that go out between cortical columns and to other places in the brain. So what we're looking at is something that's pretty complicated. So they're very complex, which means they must be doing something really complex. And whatever they're doing, that's what your neocortex is doing. So let's go back to uh, deep neural ne uh, net neurons. Um, they're fairly simple. You have the uh, uh, synapses that have uh, different weights. These are summed in the neuron body, if you wish, and they go through an activation function, normally nonlinear, which gives you your output. Now, this is based on a really naive uh, understanding of neurons around 1957, uh, and they didn't have much success until recently when people started connecting them up into deep neural nets uh, with lots of hidden layers and then you, the explosion occurred. Um, but the thing to take away is that learning is by adjusting the synaptic weights. That's how a deep neural net works. I'm not going to go into it in the processes. Those that know it uh, won't bore them and those that don't, well, you'll have to learn. Okay, so uh, the thing here is that real neurons are not like this. This is a real neuron, okay? Uh, cell body, dendrites. Uh, the, uh, each neuron has between 5,000 to 30,000 synapses or connections with other neurons. Only 10% of them, which are called proximal, and that, because they're close to the cell body, can actually cause a neural spike. So if a signal goes on to those synapses, the neuron will spike and send out a signal f further. The other 90% are called distal because they're more distant from the cell body. They don't cause a neural spike. And for many, many years, they were a mystery. What in the hell are they there for if they don't cause neural spikes? Well, it turns out that uh, they're pattern, recognition, pattern detectors, they're very good ones. So if uh, between eight or 15 synapses that are reasonably close together are fired uh, together, this will cause what's called a dendritic spike, which travels to the cell body. It's not strong enough to actually fire the neuron, but it puts it into what's called a predictive state. Uh, predictive, uh, pre a neuron that's in a predictive state will fire faster if a signal comes up, a uh, uh, feed-forward signal will come up through the uh, proximal uh, dendrites than a neuron that's not in a predictive state. And this is a, a feature that, that uh, remember because we're gonna talk a lot about that. So this is a HDM neuron. It uh, replicates the uh, dendritic structure of a real neuron. 
It doesn't go into the details of what happens in the cell, in the neuron body. It only wants to duplicate the actual processing behavior of the neuron and not the neuron details. Um, and so the behavior of a, a HDM neuron only depends on the number of uh, synapses and the location to, uh, to change its state. It doesn't depend on weights uh, as do uh, DNA neurons. A uh, neuron can be in one of four states. It can be active, which means that it's spiking or firing. It can be inactive when it's not doing anything. It can be, as I mentioned before, um, in a predictive state, and it can be active after it was in a predictive state. HDM learns the same way that biological neurons learn by strengthening synapses. So in a biological neuron, as it learns, uh, it grows synapses between the various dendri the dendrites of other neurons until it has a connection. And if it wants to forget or re uh, learn in a different way, it may break those connections. Um, HDM has uh, something, a, a synapse in HDM has a value called a permanence. So if that, and that permanence increases as it learns, uh, if, it's, if your permanence is under a particular threshold, uh, then that synapsis is disconnected. Uh, but if it crosses that threshold, then it's considered connected. So learning in HDM is making and breaking synapses and not by adjusting weights. Okay, so now we've looked at HDM neuron, let's look at a cortical column. I'm going to take just uh, one particular layer from that column, uh, and this layer I'm picking is, co uh, uh, is called sequence memory. Uh, the the uh, circles are, how am I doing for time? Um, the circles are uh, the neurons. Those of the gray are in an active state. Those of white are inactive. And you can see that some, uh, this, uh, there are columns, uh, mini columns that all the neurons are active. There are mini columns that only one or two are active. The, so the, uh, each column here is essentially a mini column of neurons. Now, if we would have look above, take a look above the uh, sequence memory, just looking from above, and mark each of the columns that has at least one neuron active, we'd get this grid that you can see in, here in the right-hand corner. And this is called a sparse distributed representation. Sparse represent, distributed representation are how our brains uh, actually uh, deal with knowledge and they're the, and they're, uh, and they're the uh, structure that the brain uh, transports around when it's processing. So each bit could ha uh, each bit can ha have some semantic meaning. Uh, it is extremely high capacity. So if my SDR is a uh, 2K in size and about 2% of the bits are active, then I can have uh, 10 to the 84 unique patterns that are uniquely identifiable, which is a huge number. Um, and if you maintain fixed sparseness, this is this 2%, and you remember I mentioned before that only 2% of the neurons in your brain are always active. So if you maintain that sparseness, then uh, it's very easy to manipulate these uh, SDRs. So if two SDRs have uh, bits in common, that means they probably have semantic information in common. And uh, comparing them is just a matter of taking intersection. And, so, and if you happen to have a union of SDRs, uh, you can easily check if a particular SDR is among the union, again, by bit manipulation. So they're very easy to work with. Um, so n let's uh, now... Uh, we have a look at that sequence memory that we saw before in the cortical column. Uh, formerly, this used to be called temporal memory, and hence the name hierarchical temporal memory. This was the name that uh, Jeff Hawkins initially gave it in his book, but uh, 
uh, over the years, research has showed that it's more, a, uh, it's more a sequential memory rather than a temporal memory. But the name is stuck, so it's still called temporal memory. Uh, I'm going to take now a slice of my layer. So I'm taking a vertical slice, and we can see the columns uh, vertically, our mini columns. Um, the green arrow is a, an example of a feed-forward or proximal input into a mini column from an SDR. And when it, uh, uh, all feed-forward inputs are routed to all the neurons in that mini column that is attached to that uh, input. So if an input comes in, and this, uh, all the mini columns get that input. So if I... Um, so let, let's have a, see if, we can, if I can explain to you how that works. So at T0, uh, I haven't learned anything, and maybe I've learned, I had a previous input, and now I, have, I put a feedforward input from the bottom, and all the mini columns that are attached to that input are activated, as you can see here on the left-hand side. Uh, Eventually, it'll learn, and once it, when it is learned, let's say we had, again, the previous input, and now this input will, uh, that input, uh, previous input comes in, it'll put uh, neurons into a predictive state. And those are the red arrows here. So if the same input that it learned before comes in, and matches up with the predictive state, it'll cause the neurons that are in predictive state to become active, which is the black. And those neurons, in turn, via their synapses and connections to other neurons, will put the neurons for the next, for the next time cycle to be in a predictive state. So uh, you can see the start of a mechanism for being able to predict inputs which is what our neuron, uh, our, our neocortex does. So an SDR, a, a, a sequential memory, learns sequences of SDRs and makes predictions about what is going to be the next input that's going to come into that sequence memory. They're extremely robust. Again, this is a feature of HDM. So if 40% uh, of the neurons in this layer uh, were destroyed, uh, it would still operate. Learning is unsupervised and continuous, so as I've mentioned before, and it can learn high easily learn high order sequences like ABCD or XCY, and uh, let's have a look at that. So I'm going to, uh, here in the top row, we have, uh, I've inputted an A and caused uh, these mini columns to become active. Then I've inputted a B, and cause these input columns to be active, and then a C, and then a D. Then I decide, okay, I'm going to now teach it another sequence, and I'm going to input an X, and then a B. You notice the B because it's the same B, because it has to be the same semantic meaning, and then a C, and then a Y. Okay, great. So it's learnt. So I'm going to test it with the same sequences. So I'm inputting an A because it's just starting. This is its first input. Nothing was predicted. So all the columns are uh, activated. Uh, by the way, this is called bursting. And then I input my B. The A has predicted the B. And when I've inputted my B, those uh, neurons that were in the predictive state are now active. And you notice that they are the same columns that were bursting before. They'd have to be the same columns because they're the same semantic information. And the semantic information is an SDR. Remember, it's only the columns that, has, that have at least one neuron active. So the same column that was bursting before now has one neuron active. So it's the same SDR is going to be output from that layer. Remember, the SDR is looking at the layers from the top. So if I look down, I'm going to see the same columns active as if in the top, in the top row. So in the bottom row, I look from the top, I see the same 
And if I now input a, uh, the B should predict a C, and if I input the C, the C will become active. Uh, those columns again line up with the C, and likewise with the D. Now I start a new sequence, I input my X, the, uh, because this is a new sequence, nothing was predicted, all the X columns bursting, and then I input a B, and you notice different neurons will, uh, have become active, but in the same columns. So it's the same semantic meaning, but it's a B that belongs to a different sequence. And this is how the memory is able to distinguish between sequences and learned sequences. And then the B will predict the C, I'll input my C, and again, uh, those, uh, a neuron from each of the respective columns that means C will become active, and then the C will predict the Y, and the Y will match up with the Y that I taught it, again, but only single neurons. Okay, just to make sure that's clear, uh, let's look at that same sequence again. I've, I've put it up the top here to remind us. And I'm going to start with my A. And my A is going to predict the B. Uh, the blue lines are some sample synaptic connections. And so we can see that the B is, become, uh, is predicting the B, which is the red dots. And then when I actually do input the B, they become active. Uh, a point that I forgot to mention was that the, uh, um, when the input comes into a mini column, it goes to all the neurons in that mini column. But if one of the neurons is in a predictive state, it'll fire faster. You remember I mentioned that's the, one of the characteristics of a predictive state. And it'll inhibit all the other neurons in that same uh, mini column, and, the, and hence you only have one neuron active in any mini one time in a mini column. And I, if I do the same thing, the B will predict the next C input. Uh, a different scenario that I want to discuss is what happens if I've taught it these sequences, but I start with a B, not with an A. Okay, I'm starting with a new sequence, which is a B, and so all the uh, neurons here uh, uh, will burst that corresponds to the B input, and so it'll, it'll have to predict both, both versions of the C, because it hasn't got enough information. So both versions of the C are predicted, and what happens when I actually put in a C? Then both versions of the C will be activated. But it's still C, because if I look at the SDR that's output from this layer, the semantic information is a C. And uh, this will, once the C is input, this will then predict both D and Y. So HDM not only can uh, learn sequences, it can also make multiple predictions. And maybe one of the sequences is, is, Later on, one of the inputs will be able to distinguish between which of the sequences is the relevant sequence. Uh, so if the, M, if the next input is a Y, it'll then only the, the Y will be active and the potential D will disappear from the, in, from the input. Okay, so starting with B and inputting C, we get prediction, due prediction. So I can make multiple predictions. It had, as you can see, that it's can handle surprises and it can handle uh, it can handle new information very elegantly. Okay, I'm going to run a demo, and uh, in this demo, I'm going to do, uh, use this uh, HDM for anomaly detection. Uh, I've got a, I'm going to input a database of um, uh, energy usage from a gym in Australia. I'm Australian, so it'll have to be an Australian gym. Um, it. The data is just two columns. Uh, each record has a date timestamp and a energy usage, and it's by hour. Uh, you can see here the in in the flow diagram we have the sequence memory. The sequence memory has to be fed SDRs because that's how it works. 
and it'll be outputting SDRs. So where do we get the input SDRs from? Well, the data uh, will have to be encoded into a single piece of information, so it's encoded in an encoder to a binary vector. That binary vector is fed into a special type of memory in HDM called a spatial pooler, which will convert it into an SDR. SDR to sequence memory. Sequence memory then will make a prediction, and that prediction in the form of an SDR, which will be passed to a classifier. And that classifier will make our prediction and maybe tell us if we've got an anomaly or not. And then by anomaly, that means that if after it's learnt uh, the patterns of usage of energy, if there's something that's, uh, that's not, not what it expects, it'll flag it as an anomaly. Okay, the special pooler I mentioned that's for converting uh, input data into SDRs. I'm not going to go into it, but basically you can feed it an n-dimensional uh, bit array, and using uh, Hebbian learning, it'll output an SDR. The learning is continuous, and it has to make sure, you have to make it has to make sure that the same input will always generate the same SDR, because your SDR is your semantic information. So if you have uh, if each time your input comes in, you get a different SDR, then you're just talking garbage. Uh, so you have to make sure that you always get a unique SDR for a unique input. And it also has to generate the SDRs in a, in a way that they maintain, they maintain semantic similarity. So if you've got two inputs that are very close together, you'd expect the SDRs to reflect that. Okay, the demo, what we're going to see in the demo here is there'll be two panes running. Uh, the top pane will have the actual input in blue and the predictions from HDM in orange. The bottom pane will be its predictions, the predictions uh, for, uh, of anomalies. So the, the, the important line here is the uh, orange line in the bottom, or red line, uh, which is the uh, anomaly likelihood. So if, if, if it jumps to one, you know that you have an anomaly is very likely. Okay, let's see if this demo... Okay, it's running. Okay, and we're going to see the records as it's reading in, in the, uh, on the left. It's only starting to learn now, and you can see that its predictions are nowhere lined up with the actual data. If the prediction's correct, it should be uh, right on top of the actual data. So that... Uh, and it's still learning at the moment, so you can see here in the bottom that the anomaly likelihood is flat, which means, and 50%, so it means that it doesn't have enough data to learn. The yellow areas are weekends. You can, weekends have different usage patterns than during the week. Weekends normally will have one or two uh, busy periods, while during the week they're more spread out throughout the day. So. This would be a day. The peaks between the days, uh, those little peaks is when, when the cleaning team comes in to clean, they switch on the lights and they start cleaning the gym. Now it started, it's learnt enough and it is uh, starting to make predictions. You can see that it's, uh, it's predictions already. At the moment we've read in 700 records only and it's already starting to make some very good predictions. And uh, if I let it run, it, it still has to, it, it still gets surprises, and you can see it still hasn't learned weekends very well. But uh, after about uh, 1,500 records, it already knows what to do with weekends. And uh, later on, we, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not I'm going, going to wait, but about after about uh, 3,000 records, uh, the usage changes dramatically. Uh, it starts uh, 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 crying gewalt and saying, well, this is, the, the world is ending. And then after it sees that this pattern continues and continues, it learns the new pattern and then says, okay, this is okay. And then when that different usage uh, ends and it goes back to the, its, its normal usage, it doesn't have to relearn it. It says, oh, I know this already, so everything's okay. So 
Okay. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard that in your brain you have something called grid cells. This, these are cells specifically, and place cells, these are cells specifically allow the, the brain to uh, learn locations and allow you to, this is how your brain knows where you are in the world and where you're going. Uh, I won't go into them. But if we take our sequence layout that we've looked at before, where it gets its features, and we add a grid layer that takes in motor input and get, gives us location, uh, the uh, HDM can learn features and locations and predict and learn whole objects. So, for instance, if I would touch, uh, start uh, touching a, a coffee cup uh, with my finger, the feeling of the edge of the coffee cup goes into the column as a feature. The location of my finger goes in as its location. And if I do this enough time, eventually I learn the coffee cup as an object in a single column. Uh, it works. So a single column in your brain can learn complete objects. And if I take lots of columns together and get them to have lateral connections between them, and they can vote, I only have to touch once to identify that coffee cup. Each finger will have its input to its own cortical column. The cortical columns will vote between each other, and it'll quickly come to the, much more quickly get to the conclusion, I'm holding a coffee cup. And if I'm looking at the coffee cup, uh, the eye has lateral connections to the same cortical columns, so the cortical columns of the eye have the same connections to the cortical columns for the touch, and they'll all vote together, and they'll say, yes, indeed, this is a coffee cup. And you've got this in HDM already, so the HDM is uh, succeeding in modeling more and more aspects of the functionality of a neocortex. Uh, so, okay, this is all very nice, this is all on paper, uh, does anybody actually use this? Well, there's already three companies that, uh, that uh, based on this technology, there's Grok that does anomaly detection using, uh, for commercial purposes, for instance, uh, industrial machinery, server farms, uh, they're, they're, uh, 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 one of their successes was that they were able to predict total failure of a, um, the, gear, the gearbox of a wind turbine 10 minutes before it occurred. So they were able to shut down that wind turbine before it self-destructed. Um, and there are other cases that's really, really interesting. Cortical I.O. used this technology for semantic processing, natural language processing. Uh, their site is really, really good, and uh, it's worth visiting and, and looking at that technology. And Intellitech uh, used the technology for trying to predict stocks on the stock market. They've been around for at least a year, so I guess they must be doing something right. Uh, uh, if you're dealing with stock markets, uh, you go down very quickly if you're wrong. Uh, here's some links to Nomenta, uh, the, the, the HDM community, uh, which I ha have a minor role in. There's, uh, if you want to learn more about it, there's a HDM school. They have a lot of excellent videos on YouTube. I'll put the slides up and the demo on my GitHub uh, after the conference. I didn't have time to do it. And there, there are my contact details, which is, seems to be getting longer every year as some new technology comes in. And I think that my time's up. If anybody has any more questions, they can come directly to me.